Good to see you here this morning. A little bit different looking crowd than I preached to last week. And uh, thankful to be back in the house at Geyer Springs this morning. As I came in this morning, I was seated down here on the front, and I had not stopped and gotten a bulletin, and I kept thinking, wait a minute, I need a bulletin for something, for some reason. I remembered uh, the ball game tonight, and for those of you that need a word of encouragement, I just wanted you to know that when you show up tonight at the gate with your, uh, the bulletin to be able to get into that ball game, I'll be there checking notes on the back. <laughs> just wanted you to know that just in case that might be important to you. Well, last week, Pastor Jason reminded us from God's Word about the unstoppable power of the gospel. Even uh, evil men like Herod, who, who may try to stop the message by eliminating the messenger, is not going to be effective because the gospel uh, cannot be stopped. Uh, God has ordained that every tribe, every tongue, every people group is going to hear the message of the gospel of Christ. It's not going to be stopped. And, and we certainly don't want to get in the way to impede the gospel, but more importantly, if we're wise, we want to help fuel the, uh, the movement of the gospel. Well, this morning, uh, we are about to hit the halfway point in Acts. We're going to speed up from this point forward. I was at a senior adult breakfast about a month ago, and, and uh, they were talking about the study through Acts. I said, yeah, but um, I'm thinking we've, we've got to keep moving. I'm thinking we're going to going to skip over the missionary journeys, and boy, that caused an uproar. So we're going to go through the missionary journeys, but we're flying, okay? We're flying. We're not taking a camel. We're taking a jet plane going through those missionary journeys. Chapter 13 and 14 this morning, um, this is the beginning of the story of the mission to the ends of the earth. You see, I titled the message, Journey to the Ends of the Earth. Now, that's not to say um, the Gentiles have not been receiving the gospel. That mission's not new. That breakthrough, if you remember, happened back in chapters 8 through 11. Uh, Philip going to the Ethiopian, Peter uh, going to Cornelius' household. Uh, the church in Antioch, which is where we're going to be this morning, was already evangelizing Gentiles in their community. By the way, let me mention something interesting about that. You may not remember, but back in chapter 11, the first mention of Antioch was that some men from Cyprus and Cyrene, some men went to Antioch in Syria and, and shared the gospel. And it says in chapter 11, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed. Here's what's interesting. We don't know who those men were. It, evidently, it wasn't one of the apostles. They're not mentioned by name. We have no idea who they were. What we know is some men made the decision to go and share in a place where the gospel had not been heard, and because of their willingness to do that, the Lord was with them, and many people believed. That's just an encouragement to you if you're not sure that you have a part in making the gospel message known. Now, what's new in chapter 13 is this. This is the first time that a local church or body of believers saw a need for witness beyond them to the bigger world, and so they commission and send out missionaries to accomplish the task. See, prior to chapter 13, most of the gospel message, most of the witness was restricted to close proximity of where a group of believers was. Uh, we know that Judea and Samaria had already been reached, but that's like saying for those of us here in Arkansas, well, we've reached central Arkansas, and we've even reached pretty much out to the, the borders of the state of Arkansas, but that's as far as it's gone. Here in chapter 13, the witness is going to the ends of the earth, just like Jesus commanded in Acts 1-8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll need that power to accomplish this task. You'll receive power, and you'll be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, the local proximity, Samaria, and to the ends of of the earth, and that's what we're beginning to see happen. So, we're looking now, starting this morning, we're looking at the church in Antioch. Uh, there's two Antiochs you'll see this morning. This is Antioch in Syria, and the church in Antioch is replacing Jerusalem as the center for gospel ministry. The church in Jerusalem is fine, it's healthy, it's going well, but now we're shifting attention to Antioch because from Antioch, the gospel is moving out. Now, we're going to move through two chapters pretty rapidly this morning. There's not going to be scripture on the screen because I wouldn't begin to try to have those guys keep up with me. But let me mention, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, either electronically or hard copy, in the backs of the uh, pews in this room in the blended service are these little New Testaments. And by the way, this is a great thing to take with you when you leave today if you don't have a Bible or if you know someone who's um, interested and open to the gospel. This one is called How to Find God, and in the very first few pages, you'll see several uh, good articles to help someone who's asking questions about God. So that's there if you need it. If you're in the venue, 
Uh, folks on the connection team have these in hand. If you'll just slip your hand up, they'll put one in your hand. But we want you to not only have those this morning, but also have those if you personally need it or if you know someone who needs a copy of God's Word. All right, let's start in, uh, in chapter 13. We're not going to read all these verses, but let's start in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 13 of Acts. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. And then it lists five of them. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a long friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the first thing we see here in verse 1 is these five men who are leading the work. You remember that Barnabas had gone to Antioch because of all that was happening there. It was growing so much he needed help. He went and found Saul, brought Saul. So we know that they're there. We know Barnabas. um, We know Saul or Paul. You notice he also mentions uh, Simeon, also called Niger, which simply means black. Simeon the black. Now that was not a racial comment in that day. It was just a description He was probably from Africa, but he's here in the church in Antioch. Lucius, Lucius was possibly one of the founders of this church in Antioch, one of the first um, that were reached. And then Menaean, who um, was, we don't know exactly the relationship, was friends with Herod. This is the same Herod that executed John the Baptist. You know what I love about that list of, of leaders of description is the diversity that's there and specifically the racial diversity. You know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the need to look like our neighborhood, look like our community, that we should be more racially diverse. Many of you know, um, I'm sure Pastor Jason mentioned last week that I was over in West Helena. And I don't know if you've ever been to the Delta. I've been different places in the Delta. It was my first trip to West Helena. It's a very depressed area um, economically, but it's also one of the most racially charged areas of our state. And I went there, and I took John with me for the purpose of saying to that small African-American church that we worshiped with last week, hey, you are important to us. And I even told him, I want you to understand that the reason you have the, the lead pastor and the lead worship pastor of one of the largest white Southern Baptist churches in the state of Arkansas here with you today is we want to be sure that you understand that we're with you, that we're one, that we're brothers. Uh, Jarvis Smith, the pastor there, is a great brother to me. You'll probably be hearing from him sometime. But I love the fact, and it's not just us, but more and more churches in our state are beginning to say, hey, it's time that we stop letting Sunday morning be the most segregated hour of the entire week, and it's time that we came together as brothers in Christ. And so these five men, Scripture tells us, are prophets and teachers. A prophet, uh, occasionally they foretold, if God gave them a message to tell about something that was to come, but primarily they were foretellers. Uh, They preached the Word of God. That's the role I have today as a prophet. They were also teachers. Teachers were uh, grounding the believers. They were discipling. They were building their faith. And it's the same work that we see in the church today. We have prophets and teachers. We're involved in not only proclaiming the word and giving the foundation of the word uh, for the church, meaning not just the corporate church, but individual believers, but also teachers who are discipling and equipping and helping to grow people into faith. Verse 2 says the Holy Spirit directed them. That's the pattern that we have seen and are seeing all through Acts. It's not the plans of men, but it's the direction of God. We saw that when Peter received the, uh, the vision to go to Cornelius, when the angel came and, and told Philip um, to go to that, that road to Gaza in, in the wilderness area. We have to be careful as the body of Christ to be in tune with the Spirit of God. We have a vision team that's been meeting Uh, I guess August or September will be coming up upon a year, and they are being careful, not just as we meet together uh, as a team, but individually to really pray and ask God, God, what is your mind and what is your direction for this body? The Spirit came and he said, set apart Paul and, and Barnabas. What does that mean? It means to be separated or to be isolated, to be called out from everyone else. And, and the work of the church is to confirm and commission those who are sent out for a pretty heavy task, and that is to advance the gospel. You know, we do commissionings here all the time. Uh, we have some, some church members who are on the field permanently. Uh, for instance, Jeff and Sandy Rowan in Indonesia, they are there. They're spending their life there among the people. We have many that go out on short-term trips. In fact, today, 
uh, already in the venue, they've had a commissioning, and, and at the end of our service in here, we are going to commission a large number of students who are going out this next couple of weeks to do the work of the gospel. It's important for us as a church to say uh, we affirm and we support the work that you're going to do. Now, skip down to verse 5. You notice in verse 5 it says that they had, uh, what, hang on, let me back up and tell you something else about sending out. I just need to be up front and honest about this because you parents are not going to like this, okay? Some Sunday mornings when I get here, not every Sunday, some Sunday mornings I make a slow drive around the building just praying over each section of the building. I don't do it every week. I'm always careful not to drive seven times around, just once. (laughs) Oh, good, you all know your Bibles. That's good. (laughs) This morning I was driving around the building, and as I drove across the back past the, uh, the preschool area and the children's building, I need to tell you parents... I prayed that God would call out young men and young women out of our body to serve him in other lands and advance the gospel, okay? I'm okay if you're mad at me. I've got one that spent four years in the Middle East. I've got another one in about a year or so is going to be somewhere in, in Africa. So I'm okay if you're mad at me. It's an awesome thing to see men and women who will give their lives to serve the Lord, and I'm praying that that happens out of our body. All right, verse 5. Says they had John, this is John Mark, to assist them. Now, John Mark was young. Uh, Barnabas knew him. Barnabas had been discipling him. We don't know all that, that John Mark did. Um, surely he was involved in some of the gospel work because he was learning. But we know that John Mark is the youngest member of the team, is the one who was sent to assist. We know he made sure that their needs were taken care of. They had to have lodging, they had to have food, so he knew, knew, we know that the practical needs were taken care of. That was part of John Mark's role and responsibility. And I want to pause right here and remind you, there are a lot of people that work behind the scenes around here. Our, our tech folks um, who work behind the scenes, a lot of folks who do a lot of things. I, I want to recognize one of them today just because we don't do that much. You know, when you come in on Sunday morning, the building is all nice and clean, everything is set up, uh, the air conditioning is running. If it's working, usually it is. It's all good. Uh, we have a security team that when you're here on Sundays and Wednesdays and other activities, I'm not going to point them out. That would kind of defeat the purpose. We have a large security team that is watching over you. And all of that, you know, I've got lots of Barnabases on staff with me. I'm not saying I'm Paul, but lots of Barnabases and some Pauls on staff. But our John Mark, uh, you guys are in the venue, know him. He's not in there. He's in here sitting in the back. Our John Mark is Doug Shelby. He's back there on the back wall. He's not back there because he doesn't like me. We're friends. He's back there because he frequently gets called out to take care of needs. But I'm so thankful, not only for Doug, but all of the teams around here that work to take care of things so we can just show up and and worship and spend time in the Word. All right, so PB and J. That's Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. (laughs) I hope you remember that. They go to Cyprus. Uh, That's Barnabas' home. They start in Salamis, which is the commercial district in the east. They move through the island to Paphos on the west end. Look in verses 6 through 8. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So they, they, they run into their first opposition. Here's Sergius Paulus. He's the, uh, the proconsul. That means he's the, the chief Roman officer of the city of Paphos. He's intelligent. He's interested in hearing about the gospel. He's a Greek, but wants to hear the gospel. And then you have Elymas, uh, the sorcerer. He opposed them. He distracted the proconsul. He tried to make sure that the gospel didn't get to him. Well, Paul, in the, in the following verses, you'll see Paul calls out Elymas, and then he calls judgment down on him. And because uh, Elymas was trying to blind the proconsul from the truth, guess what the judgment was? Temporarily, he is, he is blinded. He has to be led around by the hand. And I just mentioned that to say that you'll notice opposition does not slow them down. In fact, Paul and Barnabas and other apostles expected opposition. Why? Because Jesus had told them that. John 16, In this world, you will have trouble. He declared that up front to them. As my followers, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have opposition. But remember, he reminded them, take heart, for I have overcome the world. They may not see in all their time on earth and the opposition they face how Jesus has overcome that, but in eternity they're going to see that. 
that the opposition has not stopped the gospel, prevented the work of God. All right, so they go on. You see in verse 14, they end up, and this is the other Antioch, Antioch and Pisidia. Um, John Mark at this point has turned back. Again, he was young. Perhaps he was homesick. I think it's more likely John Mark was used to the soft, encouraging words of Barnabas, and that ain't who Paul is. Paul's kind of the gruff one. But for whatever reason, John Mark has gone back. Here they are in Antioch and Pisidia. You'll notice the first place they went, and you'll often see this in Paul's journeys, is they went to the synagogue. Why? Because Paul never gave up on the Jews. They were his people. All the opposition, even hatred, even to the point of wanting to kill him that he faced from the Jews, he still never gave up. But you also see that in the synagogue, there were Gentile God-fearers. What, what does that mean, Gentile God-fearers? It means that they had turned from their culture of worshiping many gods. They were going to the synagogue to worship uh, the true God. They had heard the Old Testament message of redemption. They understood their need as sinners, their, their need for redemption. They'd not yet heard the gospel of salvation through Christ. That word had not come to them yet, but they were God-fearers. Now look in verses 16 through 41. Paul in the synagogue is presenting the gospel. Let me just give you the the key points of the gospel. In, in verses 16 through 22, he explains all that God did for his people, for Israel. The fact that um, he, he brought them out of Egypt, that he was patient with them those 40 years in the wilderness. The fact that he was faithful when, the, when they were faithless. He was always faithful. In verses 23 through 26, that God's plan was to bring the Messiah through Israel. He had told Abraham, your nation, the nation that will come out of you, will be a blessing to all nations. What did that mean? It meant that the gospel message, that salvation, the Messiah was going to come through Israel. Verses 27 through 37, he mentions that Jesus was rejected, that the Jewish leaders refused to recognize him as Messiah, and he explains the crucifixion and the resurrection. Then in verses 38 and 39, he tells them, that through their faith in Jesus, they can be forgiven and they can be freed from the dominion of sin. And then you might glance down in verses 40 and 41, there's a warning there. He warns the scoffers. Well, what is a scoffer? A scoffer is someone who looks, down, looks on something with disdain or, or someone um, who looks at something and, and says, well, that's just unworthy of my notice or, or my response. There were people who scoffed against the gospel. They thought it was a ridiculous message, a ridiculous story, not possibly true. And I mentioned that this morning to say to you and to me, we can scoff against the gospel without saying a word when we refuse to give it notice, refuse to give it our attention or heart thought. And he's warning them, he's saying, you need to be careful, scoffers, that you don't become hard-hearted. Because you notice he says, when you become hard-hearted, when you're a scoffer, you're unable to believe even the most miraculous thing that God does. You remember that Jesus told the nation of Israel, hey, you don't need another sign. You're an unbelieving nation. You don't need another sign. They said, well, it will show us a sign. They didn't need a sign. The most miraculous thing God could have done would not have mattered to them because they were already hardened toward the gospel. We need to be careful when we become hardened toward the gospel. Verse 42 the people begged them to return the next Sabbath. I thought, wow, that would fire up a preacher, wouldn't it? Hey, would you come back next week and preach to us again? Please don't say that to me when you're walking out this morning. I know you're faking it, okay? But then in verse 45, you see the Jewish leaders, they were jealous of the crowds that Paul and Barnabas were drawing, and so they began to speak out against Paul. But Paul reminded them, hey, you had the opportunity to hear the gospel first. You pushed it aside. And therefore, the gospel has come to the Gentiles. Now, I want you to look at verse 48. I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but we need to take a couple of minutes here. You notice it says, when the Gentiles heard this, when they heard the gospel message, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Now, what does that mean, appointed to eternal life? There are two different schools of thought, and if you're not familiar with this, that's okay. I'm not going deep with this today. There are two different schools of thought or theology on salvation. One is called Calvinism. The other is called Arminianism. Calvinists like to take this passage and take the word appointed and say, see what this says is there are some people that God appointed to salvation. There are others he appointed to destruction. In other words, you have no choice in the matter. You're not able to choose to come to Christ. You have no choice in the matter. You've been appointed to one or the other. But the word appointed here doesn't mean that. In fact, 
what we're looking at in Acts is a narrative. It's not didactic. It's not teaching doctrine. Now, can we learn from a narrative? Absolutely. Is there teaching in a narrative? Absolutely. But we have to be careful not to draw a doctrinal stance out of a passage like we're reading in Acts. It's a historical narrative. Can it illustrate doctrine? Yes. But we can't take this one verse and draw a point out. So this, this phrase in Acts 13, 48, that they were pointed to salvation, it's not about irresistible grace. It's not about unconditional election. It's not about predestination. The word appointed simply means that they were put in a place or put in a position. See, these Gentiles were already disposed to receiving the gospel message. Why? Because they'd been going to the synagogue. Because they'd heard that they were sinners. They'd heard the, of the need from the Old Testament teaching. They'd heard of the need for redemption. Their hearts were open to the Lord and his working in them. It says that they were God-fearers. They had a great reverence for God. They had already accepted the message of redemption. So it was very natural when they heard that Jesus was the Messiah through whom they received redemption, they readily received the message. And so they came in great numbers to faith in Christ. Verse 50, though, says that the Jews, once again, came in. They stirred up the leading men and women of the city and drove Paul and Barnabas out. But verse 52 says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The message was not going to stop. The disciples who were already there were filled with joy because of what God had done. The new disciples were filled with joy because of Christ coming to them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the message would go on. All right, chapter 14. Take a deep breath. Here we go. We're going to fly, okay? Chapter 14, verse 1, at, Icon at Iconium. Where were they? In the synagogue. Once again, that's the first place Paul always began because there were people gathered there who were ready to receive the message. Look what it says, though. He spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Listen, it wasn't Paul speaking. I don't care how eloquent the speaker is. The power is not in the speaker. The power is in the word. When I pray on Sunday mornings before I come up here to preach, I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring life to the Word. Why? My words are dead. My words won't do anything. My words won't bring life. Only the Spirit of God, speaking the Word of God, can bring power to the Word and bring life. He spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But, once again, the city was divided. They made plans to persecute or, or beat them up and to stone them, and so they left. Verse 8 through 20, they go on to uh, Lystra. In Lystra, something interesting happens. Paul heals a man crippled from birth. Uh, again, this is a major um, Greek culture. They have many, many gods, and so the people who witness this healing of the man crippled from birth, by the way, crippled from birth is important. He wasn't crippled due to an accident or a disease because then people might say, well, um, his body healed itself or he got over the disease. No, he had always been crippled. Paul heals him and the people want to worship Paul and Barnabas like gods. And they have a, a, a very difficult time stopping them from worship. Now, Paul never through his ministry ever wanted to take credit for anything he was doing. He always gave the glory and honor to God. And he's very bold, you know that. When they try to worship him, you know the first thing he says to him, hey, your gods are vain. Don't even bother worshiping like one of your gods. Your gods are vain. They're useless. They're powerless. They're lifeless. And he tells them, look, there is one living, giving, forgiving God. He's been patient with nations and with men as they have walked in their own ways, but he's also revealed himself. And he's been gracious to all. Well, the people of Lystra want to worship Paul and Barnabas, but look down at verses 19 and 20. Here you have this group of people who think they're a god and they want to worship them, but verse 19 of chapter 14 says that the Jews came from Antioch. That's Antioch and Pisidia, not Antioch and Syria, where they were from. The Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. This is one tough dude. Now, I've seen movies and, and different pictures, depictions of Paul. I don't think any of them depict him like they ought to. This guy is tough. Okay, they stone him. And then they drag him out of the city and leave him for dead. And what does he do? Right, let, let, we don't know if he was dead or not. God clearly raises him up. These new believers gather around. Can you imagine their confusion? Here we are. 
We've just come to faith in Christ. So we're a minority in the city. And now our leader is out here, left for dead. They're gathered around him. They're probably praying. And God raises him up. Now, you might think, well, maybe he wasn't dead. Maybe he's just unconscious. But listen, he gets up. And what does he do? He walks back into the city. What in the world is he thinking? How can he even get up and walk? Well, God raised him up and supernaturally gave him the power, and he walked back in the city. What if you're one of those that stoned him? Oh, dude, I am not messing with him again, right? <laughs> Walks back into the city. So Paul and Barnabas continue to Derby and beyond. They're preaching the gospel. They're making disciples. As they come across believers, they're strengthening and encouraging them to continue their faith because it's going to be difficult. They're appointing leaders uh, for the churches as they go, as these churches are being established. And then at the end of 14, you see that they go back to Antioch um, to give a report. This is the first missions conference. And what's exciting, and if you've never been to a missions conference, what's exciting is that they're able to see all of these believers who were not on that journey, are able to see all the ways that God moved and are able to encourage, uh, be encouraged and to rejoice in that. Well, that's, that's the narration. That's the story of the first journey here in Acts 13 and 14. And while narrative is not teaching doctrine or theology necessarily, it is teaching. And, and so we ask the question, what does the record of this missionary journey teach us? Now, there's a lot here, but let me just make a few um, simple observations this morning that are, that are good application points for us today. The first is very simply this. God is able to work in the midst of opposition if we don't give in, if we don't give up. Think about the opposition just in the short time that Paul and Barnabas faced. Even satanic opposition when they encountered Elymas and, and the threats at Iconium and then the, the stoning at, at, at Lystra. All that opposition they faced, but they kept going and the gospel kept advancing in power and many people were coming to faith in Christ. Man, we get the least little bit of opposition. Somebody snickers or, or scoffs at something we say and, and we're done. No, God can work. We have to press through the opposition. Secondly, and this goes right along with that, we always need to be ready to speak the truth of the gospel. When Paul and Barnabas were in that synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia, after the law, the scrolls were read that morning, word came to them, brothers, if you have a word for us, we want to hear it. And they were ready. I, I thought when I read that of, of the, the challenge, the reminder in 1 Peter 3.15 to believers, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone to ask you the reason for the hope that you have. We should always be ready to share the word of the gospel. And then the third thing, very simply, is this. We need to remember we're called to make disciples. Who's called to make disciples? The, the prophets and teachers? No, every believer. Every believer has a responsibility in that we're called to reach people with the gospel, but then that we're also called, as we reach people with the gospel, we're called to ground and equip them in their faith. We are to be, as, as followers of Christ, we're to be in a continual process of investing our lives. That's what we're called to. Well, one last thing this morning, you know, as you look at Paul's service, you have to ask the question, what, what was Paul's motivation? What caused Paul to do those things he did? He, he clearly loved people. He literally gave his life even for the Jews who hated him and, and wanted to destroy him. Paul loved people the way Jesus did, and that takes great courage. And, and you ask, well, what motivated Paul? I thought about in Luke 7, Jesus is in the home of a Pharisee by the name of Simon having dinner. It's a dinner party. And you remember that while he's there, a woman comes in, a woman who is known for his, her sinful lifestyle, comes in, and, and she weeps at Jesus' feet, and she uses her tears to, to wash his feet, her hair to wipe his feet. She anoints his feet with his very expensive perfume. And Simon is thinking, and of course Jesus knows what he's thinking, Simon is thinking, hey, this guy's supposed to be a prophet. Does he not recognize what kind of woman this is and he's letting her touch him? And, and Jesus, knowing Simon's thoughts, says, Simon, let me ask you a story. Let me ask you a question. Let me tell you a story, ask you a question. Two men owe a debt. One owes a great debt. One owes a small debt. They owe the same lender. And the lender forgives both men their debt. Which man will love him more? Simon said, well, I suppose a man with a larger debt will love him more. Jesus said, you're exactly right. Simon, this woman has been forgiven much and has loved much. Simon, when I came into your house, you didn't even give me water to wash my feet, which was the custom of that day. 
Jesus wasn't even treated properly by Simon according to the custom of the day. Simon, this woman has been forgiven much. She has loved much. When you've been forgiven little, you love little. I think Paul understood that story that Jesus told. You remember Paul often would say that he was chief among sinners. What did he mean by that? We're all sinners. We're all on equal footing when it comes to being sinners. Paul recognized very simply that he had been forgiven much. Paul was effective in ministry because he knew how much he'd been loved by Jesus, and he loved others the same way that Jesus loved him. He was patient with people just like Jesus had been patient with him. Paul loved unconditionally. Unconditionally. Just like Jesus did. Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. There was no condition. There was no get your life right first. There was no obey me. And after you have a good track record of that, I love you. No, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us unconditionally. And Paul loved those around him, even those who hated him unconditionally. He loved sacrificially, just like Jesus did. Philippians 2, Paul himself wrote these words, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard that son to be held on to, but emptying himself, taking the form of a man, being found as a bondservant, and became obedient to the point of death. And in that passage in Philippians 2, Paul said, you need to be careful, you need to remember that it's important not to put yourself above others, but look out for the interest of others first. Paul loved unconditionally, Paul loved sacrificially. We would do well, as Paul told the Corinthians, we would do well to imitate Paul. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We mentioned one other thing this morning. It's astounding, and we've only gotten through the first missionary journey today. There are three. It's astounding to see all that Paul and Barnabas did. By the time we get through the third missionary journey, if you plotted everything on a map, you will have covered the entire known world at the time. It's astounding what Paul and Barnabas did, having no modern transportation and no modern communication. They did much with little. Can I be very frank with you today? The church, universally, and this church have done little with much. What would happen if every American committed their wealth, and we're all wealthy, committed their wealth to doing much to advance the gospel in places where it's not been heard. 